On June 9th, we looked at 2 Samuel 14 and talked about the issue of reconciliation. That sermon seemed to resonate with a lot of people, and I think that's because broken relationships are such a part of our everyday existence. That sermon, however, raised a lot of questions. And as I interacted with people after the sermon on June 9th, I realized that I could have been clearer in trying to explain how that process of reconciliation works. Fortunately, uh, as God would have it, we have an opportunity this morning to go back and revisit that idea of restoring broken relationships, which is great, because I have the chance to go back and do today what I should have done then, which is make the process clearer of how it is we go about fixing the relationships in our lives with others that may be broken, that somehow there has been some estrangement, there has been some difficulty that's happened in this relationship. Today we're going to be in 2 Samuel 21, And what I should have made clearer when we were in 2 Samuel 14 is that when we restore relationships, it's actually a three-step process. The first step in the process of fixing a relationship with someone else is the offer of reconciliation. Now that's actually what the sermon from 2 Samuel 14 was about. That's the first step, what I didn't make clear then, but by God's grace have the chance to fix this morning, was that what we were talking about in 2 Samuel 14 is just the first step in the process. The offer of reconciliation is coming to somebody that you have a broken relationship with in which there is some problem or some rift, and saying to them, look, let's make this right, let's fix this. And the point of the sermon on June 9th was that as Christians, it's our responsibility to take the initiative, whether we've been the ones who did the wrong or we were the ones who have been wronged, it doesn't matter. It's our job to take the initiative to do step one, which is to offer reconciliation. However, the point that probably wasn't as clear as I would have liked it to have been is that there's a second step in the process, that after there has been an offer of reconciliation, there needs, if there's been sin, confession and forgiveness. If there's been sin, if sin is the reason why the relationship is broken, that has to be dealt with. And the offer of reconciliation is just the first step in the process. The second step is that we've got to deal with confession and forgiveness. That would then give way to the third step in the process, which is after whatever sin has been dealt with, then you can begin the practical work of restoring the relationship. Well, again, I wish I would have made that clearer a month ago, but by God's grace, we have the opportunity today in 2 Samuel 21 to look at something that relates to step two in the process. And so although I didn't know it at the time, this sermon and that sermon really are two parts of the same thing. They both deal with restoring relationships. We've already talked about step one, the offer of reconciliation. And this morning we have a chance to look at something related to step two. When there has been sin that's come between us and another person, dealing with confession and forgiveness. And specifically this morning, we want to answer the question, what role does restitution or making amends or making things right have to do with the process of reconciliation? For example, for my wife's birthday this past year, she was very kind to me a few weeks before her birthday to tell me uh, what would be a great restaurant for us to go to to celebrate and the movie she wanted to see. Now, this is actually very kind of her because I'm terrible at planning this kind of stuff. And so it was a few weeks before her birthday and she told me, she's like, this is the restaurant I'd love to go to and this is the movie I'd like to see. Well, this is great. 
So now I'm suddenly relieved because the planning phase for her birthday is over. And so I promptly forgot all about it (laughs) and didn't make a reservation. On the morning of her birthday, now I knew it was her birthday, I didn't forget her birthday. On the morning of her birthday, I said, hey, what do you want to do today for your birthday? (laughs) Yep, yep, you got it. (laughs) So now she was not super happy, but she was kind enough to remind me of our previous conversation about what it is we were going to be doing for her birthday. The problem was when I called the restaurant, there were no reservations available that would allow us to go to dinner and then to the movie. Now, of course, it's my job to apologize because that lack of attention to detail, then that's not good. (laughs) But the question is, Not only is it necessary that I apologize, and you already know the answer, is it not necessary that there's something that must be done to make it right? Yes. (laughs) Restitution, making amends, and that's what we're talking about this morning, is that when there has been some sin or some, some rift in a relationship as a result of a lack of attention to detail or insensitivity, It's not enough simply to say, I'm sorry. What role does restitution or making amends or making things right play in that process? Now, the thing with the birthday, it's it's important, but obviously there are bigger things, like for example, if there is a strain in your relationship with your daughter, because during her growing up years, you were too busy working and neglecting her, What role does restitution play in the process of trying to fix that relationship? That's what we want to look at this morning. And if you're not still there, you want to be in 2 Samuel 21, the passage that Jacob read to us this morning, 2 Samuel 21. In 2 Samuel 21, we hear the story of uh, a very interesting story of what happens in Israel when David is king. Now, the background for the story is, way back in Joshua chapter 9, as the Israelites were coming into the land, they made a deal with the Gibeonites, which was the Gibeonites agreed to be woodcutters and water carriers for the Israelites in exchange for the Israelites promising they would never attack or kill the Gibeonites. So Gibeonites are not Israelites, but they do live in the land of Palestine or the land of Canaan. And when Israel first came into a land, they made a deal with the Gibeonites. You serve us, we'll take care of you. And that deal had been capped up until the time of Saul. And then Saul, we are told in his nationalistic zeal, attacked and tried to annihilate the Gibeonites. Now, interestingly enough, God deals with this issue not during the reign of Saul, but during the reign of David. Saul has long since died, but now there's a famine in the land, and David is like, what in the world is going on? Year one of the famine, not good. Year two, not good. Year three, David's like, okay, look, this doesn't seem normal. And so he finds out from the Lord that it's because there is a problem between the relationship between Israel and Gibeon. And this gives us an opportunity to look at restoring relationships. Look in verse number two as we pick up the story. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Okay, if you remember back to our process of restoration, that's step one. He's initiating an offer of reconciliation. He's taken it upon himself. David has taken it upon himself to invite the Gibeonites to say, okay, look, we got a problem in our relationship. I didn't know it before, but God's told me. There's a problem in our relationship. David takes the initiative, that's step one, to offer reconciliation to say, okay, look, let's work this thing out. That's step one in the process. Jump down to verse 3. Here we come to the point we want to talk about this morning, which is step 2. 
David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make amends so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? Now, the Lord's inheritance is Israel. David is saying, look, we got a problem in our relationship. What should I do in order to fix this? How do I make restitution so that you will then be a blessing to us? So that this relationship can be restored. Now, where did David get this idea of making restitution? Where did he get this idea of making amends? Well, he didn't think it up himself. It's a central part of Israel's law. Numbers chapter 5. In the middle of the Mosaic law, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, When a man or woman wrongs another in any way, and so is unfaithful to the Lord, that person is guilty and must confess the sin he has committed. He must make full restitution for his wrong, add one-fifth to it, and give it all to the person he has wronged. The idea of restitution is part of the Mosaic law, not just in numbers we find in the story of Jacob. Remember, Jacob stole his brother Esau's blessing. Years later, after Jacob had accrued a great amount of wealth and was coming back trying to reestablish the relationship with Esau, this same word for restitution or make amends is used. Jacob sends Esau a large financial gift as a way of making restitution for stealing the blessing. You heard Pastor Bruce talk about it in the story of Zacchaeus. When Zacchaeus comes to faith and under conviction, he says, if I have wronged anybody, I will pay back four times the amount that I've stolen. The idea of restitution, this is part of how God wants us to interact with one another. When there has been a sin, there needs to be restitution or making amends. Now, it's easy to see from the Mosaic law or from the story of Zacchaeus or from the story of Jacob how when there is a financial sin, restitution can be easy. You simply take it and add a fifth to it, or in Zacchaeus's case, four times as much, or in Jacob's case. But there's some level of restitution of financial blessing. That's easy for us to see, but what David understands is, is the spirit of this law is, is that even when there's not been a financial sin, there still needs to be restitution. And so David says to the Gibeonites, how do I make this right? Well, in this story then, we have the opportunity to see four principles about how the process of restitution is supposed to work in our lives. I want to share those with you this morning. Principle number one is we think about making restitution Restitution is the sign that true confession has taken place. <clears throat> restitution is the sign that somebody is truly sorry for what they've done. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. What Paul's saying is, look, there's two kinds of ways to be sorry. You can be sorry that you got caught, and you can be sorry because you hurt another person. How do you know when someone is truly sorry? How do you know when somebody is saying, I'm sorry, whether they're simply sorry they got caught, or they're sorry that they have hurt you? Well, verse number 11. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, and then this last phrase, what readiness to see justice done, what readiness to make things right. In other words, the readiness to make restitution. Restitution is one of the signs that true confession has taken place. 
the way the Gibeonites can know that David truly thinks they've been wronged, and not just he wants the famine to end, is that he offers to make restitution. He offers to make things right. Likewise, I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon that if your daughter or son, there's some rift in your relationship with them because you were too busy working, too busy spending time on yourself when they were growing up and you basically ignored them or neglected them. It's one thing to come to them and say, hey, look, I, I wasn't the dad uh, I should have been or I wasn't the mom I should have been when you were growing up and I'm sorry. It's very different to come and say, I wasn't the parent I needed to be when you were younger and I'm ready to sacrifice what I had been planning for my retirement years in order that I can do whatever I can to try to make it right. That offer of restitution, that offer of trying to make it right, trying to make, that shows that the person really does understand the depth of what it is that they've done. And so the first principle is, is that restitution or making amends is a sign that true repentance has happened. That the person is not just sorry for the results, but they're actually realizing the depth of the sin that they've committed. Second principle. It's often a good idea to ask the offended party what would make it right in their minds. Notice that David says to them, what shall I do for you? How shall I make amends? Now, you don't have to do this. This is just a general principle. But it's not a bad idea that if you have wronged somebody, to actually go to them and say, look, how can I make this right? Because it's interesting, the Gibeonites say, well, it's not money. Money's not going to do it. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking to be paid off for this thing. What they want is they want justice. To be done. They want some sort of sign that they've been wronged. They've been dishonored because they had kept their part of the treaty, their part of the covenant, and Israel had not kept theirs. And so they want some sort of acknowledgement that they were truly wronged in this. And so they, together they work that out. So the principle is it's not a bad idea to ask the person who's been wronged, how can I make this right? So wives, if this might be applicable, Perhaps if you come to your husband and say, I've been spending way too much time and emotional energy on trying to please my extended family, and I've been ignoring you in the process. If that's true, it's not a bad idea to say, how can I make it up to you? Perhaps your husband would say, well, if we could take a break from family stuff for a while, that would be good. Perhaps your husband would say, you know what, maybe if we just... Uh, if we could join a softball league together, just do something, just the two of us spending time together. Perhaps your husband might say to you, you know what, it would be great if we could just, if we could have a date night once a month where it's just the two of us hanging out and we weren't talking about family or thinking about all that. Whatever it may be, it's not a bad idea to give the person that you or I have wronged the opportunity to say what would make it right in their mind. That's what David does here. Third principle. Total restitution is not always possible. In fact, it's rarely possible. Saul slaughtered thousands of Gibeonites. There's no way for David to make that up. Saul doesn't even have thousands of descendants that David could give in exchange for those Gibeonites. There's no way to go back and undo this wrong that had been done. Total restitution in this case is simply not possible. But what David does is he does something that is significant and symbolic. Seven men are chosen as a sign. Seven represents wholeness or completeness. This is not total rec uh, rec restitution, but it is a significant symbolic gesture about restitution. And in many times, that's the best that we can do, but it's acceptable to the Lord. So too, perhaps your friend that has been struggling with cancer, 
that you, because of the difficulties of that situation, have just ignored them and stepped away and not played any role. And now it's simply gotten worse and worse and you haven't been able to be bothered with what they've been going through. And suddenly you've been struck to the heart and feel like, what a terrible friend I've been. But maybe there's only a few months left. There's no way to go back and to fix all of those years, to fix that time. But simply offering the last few months and saying, look, it's the best that I can give. That symbolic act, that can function as a matter of restitution, to make things right. To say, I should have been here for the past couple of years and I wasn't and I'm sorry. But whatever time you have left, I'm here for you. Total restitution is not always possible. Likewise, suppose that a long time ago, you cheated your former business partner out of some significant financial income. Maybe you pushed him or her out of the business, and maybe they have long since passed away. There's no way to financially make it right. They're not, a, they're not around anymore. Maybe the money's even gone. But it is possible for that person's children or grandchildren for you to do something financial for them. And even if it's only a portion of what should be done but can't, there is something powerful about that symbol of saying, look, I cannot go back and undo this. But I can do something. Something that is symbolic of what really ultimately should be done. And doing that for that person's children or grandchildren can be a way of making restitution. And you say, well, but the person who I cheated is, is gone. How doing it for their children or grandchildren, how is that helpful? Well, that leads us to the fourth and final point with restitution. And that is restitution functions within the field of corporate solidarity. Restitution functions within the field of corporate solidarity. Solidarity. What do I mean by that? Does anybody think it's strange that David is suffering for something that Saul did? Anybody else think that's strange? Yeah, David didn't slaughter any Gibeonites. This wasn't his idea. He didn't go and do this. Yet he's still suffering as a result. The nation is suffering under his leadership. Why? Well, he's the king of Israel, and the king of Israel did something wrong. It doesn't matter that it was the previous king. The fact that Saul died didn't undo the injustice. The Gibeonites have been wronged by the nation of Israel. The fact that the leadership has changed, apparently in God's mind, doesn't change anything. And in fact, you might argue that God waited and held this over till David was king, because he knew David was the one who was going to respond. Saul would have just ignored this. The famine would have never gotten through to Saul. But in David's case, it did. Does anybody think it's strange that somehow Saul's descendants dying is right when it was Saul who did this thing? The reason why we don't understand this is we don't normally operate in the field of corporate solidarity. Corporate solidarity is the idea that it's not just individual responsibility. It means we're part of a bigger group. And if somebody else made decisions, but we're still part of that group, we may be responsible for it. What that means is as parents, if your adult son treats his wife inappropriately, it may be necessary for you to make restitution for that. It means that the elders of Calvary Church, the current elders of Calvary Church, may have to make restitution for some decisions that prior elders of Calvary Church made, even though there may be nobody on the board that's the same now as there was then. It means that business owners or you may be responsible for making restitution for something that one of your employees did. This is corporate solidarity. And as Americans, we don't think this way. 
but God does. That there is a connectedness amongst us and that parents often end up having to make restitution for what their children have done. And that church leaders often have to make restitution for things that prior church leaders did. That sometimes leaders in a nation have to make restitution for mistakes that previous generations of leaders made. Business leaders, leaders in academia, in God's economy, restitution functions within the realm of corporate solidarity. And we should be glad that it does. Because without it, we wouldn't be saved. What do I mean by that? Well, when we talk about the process of reconciliation, making things right between humans. Everything we know about the process of reconciliation, making things right between humans, comes from how we make things right with God. So think back to this three-step process, but not in terms of connections with other humans, but in terms of our connection with God. Step one in the process is there's got to be an offer of reconciliation. As humans, we're estranged from God. There has to be an offer of reconciliation, but we know that God has made that offer in Jesus. That basically what God is saying to the whole world is, look, I want you to be part of my family. That God has already said, look, come and join my family. That's step one, the offer of reconciliation. But the question in step two is, is that in order for the relationship with God to be fixed, there still has to be confession and forgiveness. Well, you say, well, yeah, I understand that. I have to confess my sins. Like if I don't confess my sins and I'm not forgiven for my sins, well, then I can't have a relationship with God. But the question from this morning is, where does restitution play a role in that process in our relationship with God? If restitution is part of the Mosaic law, if restitution is part of how we fix this thing, how do we make restitution to God for how we've wronged him? Well, this passage actually tells us. Chapter 21, verse 3. How shall I make amends? That word that is translated make amends, same word that was in Numbers 5, same word that's used in Jacob in his relationship with Esau. When it's used between humans, we translate it make amends or make restitution. But the Hebrew word is kapoor. And when we translate it in our relationship with God, it's translated by the word atonement. So when you read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, and we talk about Jesus, it says, For this reason, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make restitution for the sins of the people. Here's what's happening. Because of corporate solidarity, Jesus becoming one of us means that he can make restitution for our sins. That just like in Saul's case, what Saul did deserved death, yet it was his children who paid the penalty for him. And they were able to do it because God viewed them through the lens of corporate solidarity. That someone other than the individual actor can make restitution for what had gone wrong. Our whole salvation is based on this. The idea is, is that God wants us in a relationship with him, but the problem is we have wronged God. And it's not enough to simply say, I'm sorry. The wages of sin is death. The punishment for what we did is death. Somebody's got to make restitution. Somebody's got to make it right. Somebody's got to make amends. And so God provided Jesus to become one of us so that when we accept him as our Lord, when we say, I'm with Jesus, 
then God can apply what Jesus did to our account. It's corporate solidarity. Because he's one of us, his death makes restitution for our sins. So what's the takeaway? What are we supposed to do with 2 Samuel 21? Well, let's go back to the three-step process and talk through this. If you have a broken relationship between you and another person, step one, there needs to be an offer of reconciliation. That was what we talked about from 2 Samuel chapter 14. That basically, you and I as Christians have the responsibility of going to the other person and saying, look, something in our relationship is broken. We need to get this fixed. If you've not yet done that, perhaps on June 9th, God was speaking to you and said, you need to take this step and you haven't done that yet. Here's a second chance. God may be reminding you again, look, I want you to go back to that person. I want you to go to that person and offer to them to fix the relationship. You say, well, what if I did that and they didn't respond? I actually have one of those situations myself personally. If that's the case, you're stuck in step one and we simply wait for the Lord to bring conviction in the person's life for them to respond. You've done what the Lord has asked you to do and you're waiting in step number one. But suppose they have responded. Well, then you and I are on to step two. And step two is, if there has been sin that caused the rift in this relationship, if this relationship is broken because of something they have done to you, then the step is to go to them and to say, this is how you've sinned against me. If they're not willing to hear that, you have to wait for the Lord to bring conviction in their life. If they are willing, then the two of you work together to think, how do we make this right? How do we fix this? If during that conversation they bring up something that you did to them, then you have to ask the Lord, is this right? And if it is, work through how for you to make amends to them, to bring restoration to the process. Once that has happened, then you're ready for step three, which is actually rebuilding the relationship, going through the practical steps of how do we fix this relationship and make it right. And what I wished I had made clearer on June 9th, hopefully is clearer today, that if there is a relationship you have in your life that's broken, this is what God is asking us to do. He's asking us, number one, take the initiative to try to get this fixed. Number two, deal with the sin that may have caused this. Make restitution or help the other person make restitution so that there can be forgiveness. And then step three, start to rebuild the relationship. So the takeaway from this morning is, is in that, where are you in this process? In that relationship that might be broken down with a former spouse or that might be broken down with a parent or an old friend, where are you in this relationship? Are you waiting for them to respond to your offer of reconciliation? Have they accused you of sin, but you're like, that's not sin, and you're praying and asking the Lord to show you whether it is or not? Where are you in this process? because God wants you to continue to move forward. And if there needs to be restitution or making amends, asking the Lord to guide you through this. Look, this is difficult. It's tricky. It's hard. Relationships are so hard. But I'm here to encourage you that God wants to lead you through this process. He wants to help you. He wants you to have restored, reconciled, beautiful relationships again. And that if you'll simply do what he's asked us to do, he'll lead us through it together. And what's the takeaway if you're here and you're not yet a Christian? The same process is something that God is already trying to do in your life. Step one, he's offered reconciliation. He's already invited you to be part of his family. Step two, he's provided the restitution necessary that you have wronged God by disobeying him, by neglecting him, by ignoring him. But God is not demanding that you make restitution. He's willing to make it for you. All you must do is accept Jesus as your Lord. And when you say to God, I'm with him, then his payment becomes your payment. And he makes restitution for your sins. 
And that leads to step three, and God begins to restore a relationship, to build a relationship with you. And if you're here this morning and if you never responded, I'm telling you, God so desperately wants to have a relationship with you that he's going through this process, but he's done all of the work. He's made the offer of reconciliation. He's initiated reconciliation. He's provided restitution. And he's simply waiting for you to accept it so that he can restore a relationship with you.